Let's take our Bibles to 1 John chapter 2 tonight. 1 John chapter 2. Let's continue our Bible study. I've entitled Knowing the Christ of Christianity. I'm curious if there's anybody who was a religious, maybe even would even call yourself a Christian, was a religious person, went to a perhaps a Christian church for a while before you became truly born again. Is there anybody like that at all? All right, a couple people. I've been sharing this particular title with some of my friends and family that I've talked to uh, about kind of, you know, people ask me, what are you preaching on, what are you teaching on? And I said, well, Sunday morning we're going through Hebrews 11, talking about faith and the believer's walk of faith. Sunday night we're doing something called Knowing the Christ of Christianity. One of the things that I'm going to be doing this year for our um, high school students at our school, and um, I'm going to be talking to Don Mannion about possibly doing something similar for the teen group, is an apologetics class. This apologetics class will be once a week during Bible class. We'll have four days of Bible, one day of apologetics. Does anybody know what the word apologetics means? What does that mean? Defense of the faith? Defense, yeah. Uh, defense of the scriptures? Defense of your belief system? Apologia is the Greek word to defend. And so many of our young people sometimes can have a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. And there's a critical age where Eric and Thais are at in their walk with God, that they have to make up their mind, do they really know the Christ of their, quote, Christianity? Do they know what they believe? And I'm not saying it's limited to a 19-year-old. I'm saying that we all need to think about, are we seeking to know the Christ of Christianity? Because when you understand what this word means, the word know carries with the idea of an experiential knowledge that we've not only experienced salvation and that we've been born again, but that we continue to know God in an intimate way. In fact, the Hebrew equivalent is the idea of, and Adam knew Eve, and they had Seth, right? It's this, the physical union, that closeness. And so when we think about knowing the Christ of Christianity, we've talked about the word fellowship. The word fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia. It means communion. It means something in common. We talk about this when we shake hands and, and strike a deal. We have something in common. The word fellowship is important. So that's been kind of the theme. What is our fellowship with God? How do we have fellowship with God? It's through Christ, our Savior, through Jesus, our Savior. And so tonight, if you're taking notes, here's the next point. It's the maturity of Christian fellowship. We've already talked about the foundation of Christian fellowship. We talked about the purity of Christian fellowship. And now we're going to be looking at the maturity of Christian fellowship. And, and we're in uh, 1 John chapter 2. We talked about the assurance of Christian fellowship the last time I, I preached on this. But now we get to verse um, 12 of chapter 2. All right, 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, the maturity of Christian fellowship. Now, it's always good when, when the author, and we know he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit, but the author here is the Apostle John, who knew Christ. In fact, if you were to read the very beginning of this letter, he talks about how we have seen the risen Christ. We know him. We've handled him. We've seen him. Why? Because there were those that were teaching that Christ only appeared to be a man. He never really was. And even in his risen state, he really wasn't in his glorified state. And John says, we've seen him. We've handled him. We've touched him. We know who he is. He is the word of life. And if we ex truly have experienced Christ, we know him intimately. These things have I written unto you that ye may know that ye have what? Eternal life. How do you know that? Because you have a relationship with God. Through who? Through Jesus. And so now he says in verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are what, church? Forgiven. Your sins are forgiven you for his namesake, for, for Christ's namesake. I write unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children, because ye have known the Father. Notice the, the, the F there is capitalized. I have written unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Lord willing, tonight I want to look at the three parts of the family of God that are revealed to us 
by the Apostle John as he's communicating uh, to the, the church, and he's talking about the three levels of maturity, okay? So from John's pastoral perspective, he saw three stages of maturity present within the family of God. The first one is little children. Second one he writes are young men. The third one is fathers. Now I, please, I want you to understand that I believe that he's giving this as a way of identifying three aspects of maturity within the church. This wasn't in any way to slight anyone, to make somebody feel uh, inferior. He was just saying, and that is the case with every church, with every uh, body of Christ. When you think about it, we have uh, people who are newly saved, growing in their faith. We have young men, and I think it's fair to say that I think he means John is talking about people who have a passion for God, and they, they have overcome but they still don't have that maturity yet, and they're still growing in the Lord. And fathers represents those who are spiritually mature believers who have a position of leadership uh, in, their, in their lives personally and then have, a, have that elder states, you know, elder position in the church. And so as we think about the family of God, that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. We're, we're really going to focus on the first one. We may get to the second one tonight, but we'll save the fathers for uh, some time in the future. So let's tackle this, the little children, all right? What do you think John means by that? Well, this title, I believe, refers to members of the family of God who are in the stage of newborn infancy. Um, let's have some interaction tonight. What, what would be um, examples of what little ones, and I'm talking about babies, what they do? All right, not trying to be a trick question at all here. What do little babies do? I'll start with my wife, who's smiling at me, because we've had seven of these little monkeys, I mean little babies over the years. What, what, are they, what are they known to do? All right, I think you covered it all. Eat, sleep, cry, poop. Not really aware of others? Sure. Yep. And sometimes we're, we're happy. Sometimes when they identify, they can see a face that they recognize, like mommy's face, daddy's face. Johnny? Kindness? Let's, all right. <laughs> Somebody else. Joan? Totally dependent on mom and dad? Sure. Good. Let's add to that. Anybody else? Yes, Roger. Learning? Okay. And so, all right. Yes, Tim? Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. And as they get older, they understand a little bit more. You know, and so it's interesting. The word that's translated little children is technion in the Greek. And it's a word that's used to describe Christians in general as the children of God. As we think about it, it's, it's not the only, it's, in fact, it's not the most common word for baby, but it's just the word that John uses here. So there's some intimacy in here. There's some intimacy. There's a picture that I have in my office of me holding Daniel as a little baby. And uh, I had one smart aleck teenager not too long ago in my office. Called, Who's that guy holding Daniel as a baby? I said, who do you think? It's you with hair, huh? It probably was Thais who said it. And as I was holding my first child, right? And this was all new to me. Overwhelming feeling of, of being afraid and excited at the same time. You know that feeling, right? So he's using this intimate term to describe the tenderness of a newborn Christian. That's why he says little children. Because things are new to them. Their experiences are new. What is it that sometimes you have to do to even kids? You have to remind them of things that they may not be confident in. And so we'll notice that. We'll see this, as, especially in this particular uh, passage. Paul uses the same word, technion, here in Galatians chapter 4. Remember, he's rebuking them in love because the, the churches of Galatia were struggling with understanding the purpose of the law. There were some people thinking that the law was needed for salvation. So look what he says. He goes, my little children, same phrase. So the King James translators took technion. They translated it here. They translated it the same way in 1 John. It says, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed into you, in you. He goes on to say, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. He was concerned about them. Because instead of growing, they were relapsing back into this infancy, this stage of underdevelopment in their understanding of grace and salvation. Do you see how he uses this word? 
And so as we look back here in verse 12, he says, I write unto you little children. The tenderness, the relationship that John has with them. He wanted to know them. He wanted them to understand truly where they were, living in the reality of their identity. They're loved. And John was communicating not only his personal love for them, but also his, the love that God has for them. Think about this. Like a newborn infant, when a person is born into the family of God, uh, they do not fully understand all there is to know about their new life in Christ, do they? And that's why they're going to grow. And, and just like was said earlier about how a baby sometimes is unaware of who's taking care of them or understanding all the things that are going on around them, a newborn Christian is still trying to figure these things out. That's why it's encouraging uh, to see a newborn Christian that has a desire to grow. But that's why it's so important that we continue to minister to those who are newly saved and not expect them to do things that they're not ready to do yet. But helping them, encouraging them, coming alongside with them, and they're going to have their struggles and they're going to be maybe uncertain about certain things. And we encourage them and help them. And so he says, my little children. Another thought to think about is this. The Apostle John's encouragement was to assure them that their sins are surely forgiven. Remember this morning when uh, we were reading the, the story of Joseph? And, and you know, the, the, the brothers realize, okay, Jacob, our father, is dead. Now Joseph's going to get us. We're dead meat. What do they do? They send a messenger. <laughs> Tell Joseph, you know, we'll work for him. We'll do whatever. They were not assured of their forgiveness because they didn't understand it. It wasn't because Joseph hadn't truly forgiven them. It wasn't Joseph's fault. And look what it says in verse 12. I write unto you little children. He begins with them by saying, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Who's the his? For Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Church, never get over the fact. Live in the reality of your identity. Your sins are forever forgiven. Hallelujah. That doesn't move you to praise the Lord. Something's not right here. We have to ask ourselves that question often. Do I live in that reality? Or do I speak in terms of this as if I'm still an unsaved person? I've heard Christians speak in pre-salvation terms about their salvation, about their Christian life. That, that's not how it's supposed to be. Live in the reality of your identity. You're forgiven, and you stand in the presence of God as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And so this is awesome to think about. But he writes to them as little children because he loves them. And that's how we're seen by God. Just as an infant is expected to grow and mature, it is the same way with a spiritual infant. So what is it that we are excited about? What is it that we see with Spencer and Heidi with their little one, Devin? And she's kind of toddling and she's walking now, and, and they're all excited about that. I mean, we were excited about that when our kids were, were, were taking their first steps and then running around and riding the bike for the first time. We're excited about that. Isn't it exciting sometimes when the new Christian shares with you a past scripture that you've probably read a thousand times? And they say, have you ever read this in Romans chapter 8? This is awesome. Be excited with them. Pretend you've never read that passage and be as excited with them as they are with you. Share with them their enthusiasm, their zeal, their passion, but we desire to grow. And so that's why you can see that there's a couple times where the Apostle Paul kind of rebukes, like especially the Corinthian church, because they weren't growing. And he said, hey, you're supposed to be growing. There are certain things that we expect of Daniel and Josh and even Luke that we don't expect of Johnny and Caleb. And that's, every parent understands that and, and, and things that are expected of them. But there's things that we expect of Caleb and Johnny that we don't expect of Mike and Andrew yet. So there's spiritual growth. There's the spiritual maturity. God does not intend his children to remain in the stage of newborn infancy forever. What would be some of those signs? Well, you regress in your spiritual walk when you choose to be selfish. I didn't necessarily hear that as a description of a baby because it's kind of mean to say that. I mean, you know, babies cry not because they're trying to fool their parents. They cry instinctively because they need something. But sometimes they cry because they want something they don't necessarily have to have with their babies. But we look at this and say, babies oftentimes are characterized by kind of a me-centered world. But you don't want that to be the case when someone is 20, but yet the millennials are constantly made fun of because they are the me generation who have no, you know, that, that, that seems to be their world. It's all about me. It's all about what pleases me. It's all about what I can get. 
And that's just the egocentric world that we live in, and especially in our culture. I think it's fed by other things, and that's a whole other sermon. But think about this. In your spiritual walk with God, when you decide to live for yourself and not for the glory of God, you are regressing in your walk with God. Sometimes we call it backsliding, right? What would be some other things that would happen that would not allow us to grow? What would hinder our growth? What could hinder a newborn or a little child's growth in the Lord? Anybody? What would hinder? Okay, wow, great. Go ahead, Melody. If they're not loved, if they don't feel that love, okay, good. Uh, Mom, go ahead. They're not fed, Joan. Yes, reading God's word or being taught properly. Yeah, being fed, right? Okay, Don. Yeah. Sure. And these are all these are all very important. And so when we think about it, God doesn't intend for his children to remain in the stage of newborn infancy. But you know what? As older believers, as wiser believers, we need to come alongside our our newborn uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and encourage them. Not wonder why a two-year-old can't juggle or can't ride a bike, spiritually speaking. Sometimes you see that, you know, like, what's their problem? They, they ought to be in church. It's like, they, they should, but they're still, they're still young. They need to be encouraged. Well, they're struggling with this, and I don't understand. Well, okay, maybe you're not quite as mature as you think you are because where were you when you first got saved? What, what were you still struggling with after you got saved? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it's interesting how he uh, transitions in this part of his letter. Peter says this, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Oh, by the way, Christians can do that. You wouldn't be asking Christians to set it aside if they were incapable of doing that. Of course they were. We can, we can have malice. We can have guile. We can have hypocrisies. We can have envies. We can have do evil speakings. We set it aside. That's a sign of spiritual immaturity. And then what he says, as newborn babes, just like a, a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may what? Grow thereby. And that's God's call. That's what he desires of us. In verse 13, back in our text of Scripture in 1 John chapter 2, he says, I write unto you fathers. Now, we're going to skip that because I'm doing it kind of more in the order of, of little children, young men, and fathers. But we're going to transition to young men. <clears throat> and I do believe that little children is, is obviously all people, male or female. And I think here, even though it says young men, I think it's just talking about young people. But you'll notice a couple of things that are very important, why he uses this and why it's translated this way. This title refers to members of the family of God who are in the stage of strong intensity. I would say that this is kind of where I was at when I was in Bible college. Not <clears throat> in any way ready to be doing what I'm doing now. I had a passion to conquer the world, but I wasn't in a father stage, spiritually speaking. Um, 20 years old, 21, 22. And so the strong intensity is a great zeal. That zeal needs to be tempered with wisdom, okay? It's the person who's ready to charge in the battle, and they don't have the, the armor on quite right, all right? So they have that zeal. And, and so here, look what it says in verse 13. He says, he says, I write to you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. Notice fathers, it's repeated twice in 13 and 14. That's not an error. They're the ones that really know who Christ is. We'll get to that, Lord willing, some other time. But it says here in verse 13, he says, he says, I run into you, young men, because you have what? Overcome the wicked one. Who's the wicked one? Our enemy, our adversary, Satan. You've overcome him. You're not letting him be Lord of your life. I read unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. Then he goes on to say, I run unto you, fathers, because you've known him that is from the beginning. That's Christ. I've written unto you, young men, because you're what? You're strong. The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So there's some repetition here. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's interesting. If you're taking notes, note this. The word that's translated young men is actually a word that is used to describe men under the age of 40 who were able to take up arms and fight in battle. Okay? So just because you are between, let's say, the ages of 20 and 40 doesn't necessarily mean you're a young man spiritually. But that's that word. That's how that word would have been used in classical Greek. So it's really, when we say able-bodied men, soldiers. And so this word here is someone who has overcome the wicked one, but still not necessarily in a state of maturity to really lead um, 
in, 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 a, in a powerful way. But yet, God has given them victory. God has strengthened them. So there's this strong intensity. They have overcome the wicked one. And they are indeed strong men. So it's not saying that they're not spiritually mature. They're spiritually growing. They're going in the right direction. They're headed in the right direction. Let's give a couple thoughts on this tonight. The use of this phrase symbolically represents believers in Christ who have a true understanding of God's word and are ready to put it into practice. So this is not, a, this is not talking about Christians who have, uh, a, um, who have a, a great understanding of the Bible but don't know how to put it into practice. And there are those. They can give you all the right answers. They're the walking Bible, Bible encyclopedias. They can pass every, every test and quiz in, in Bible class, but they don't know how to put it into practice when they're around the, law, the unsaved, when they're being tempted, when they're by themselves, perhaps. And this is the strengthening part of the strong men, he doesn't, he, the young men, is that they're strong in the Lord. They recognize that their strength is not from themselves. Another thought to think about is this. They are living in the reality of their identity in Christ. All right? They're living in the reality of their identity in Christ by doing what? Exercising their faith, loving the word of God, and overcoming the wicked one. Where do we find that? Let's look back in verse 14 that we just read a moment ago. I write unto you fathers because you've known him that's from the beginning. I write unto you, to you, to you um, young men, because ye are what? What's the first one? What does it say? Strong. Never do we see this as just talking about some type of physical strength. For the weapons of our warfare are not what? Carnal, but mighty through who? Through God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So we're not talking about young men. I, I, I would like to consider myself in this category physically, but I'm reminded of every time I play basketball with my boys or run around with them that I'm, not, I'm leaning towards the other category. But anyways, but you think about it, this, this, this physical strength. I'm a warrior. I'm a soldier. I'm fit. I'm ready to tackle the world. And though he's using that, he wants you to see it spiritually, young men, young women who are growing in the Lord, they're strong, but they recognize that the strength does not come from themselves. There's a lot of people who are very good at appearing to be righteous, but they deny the power thereof. People that are trying to earn their way to heaven may have an appearance of holiness. They may appear very good but yet they're probably having an inner turmoil all the time because they're trying to be perfect and no one can. That's why we need to call upon the name of the Lord and trust Christ as our Savior because we know that we're sinners by nature and by choice. But people that are trying to earn their way to heaven, they may appear godly. They may appear holy. There's, in fact, that's a characteristic of a false teacher, like an, you know, an angel of, of unrighteousness that's turned themselves... Uh, change them. So, so, so sometimes we see that in, in young people where there's, there's this emphasis on being strong, but it's all about themselves. That is not the Christian life. Is it, church? It's not. Be strong in the Lord. So God gives you grace. He gives you strength to live out a life of holiness, that you're not just repressing sin. You are living the Spirit-filled life. Walk in the, in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So it's not trying to be the best we can be and turn over a new leaf and, 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 and be good. It's saying, Lord, I am absolutely inadequate to live out the Christian life. Your power must flow in through me. And that's what a young man here is able to understand. He's strong. So he's exercising faith. Then it says in verse 14, he says, the word of God abideth in you. What does that mean? What does that mean? The word of God abides in you. Let me think, Tim. Yes. Yeah. The word abide carries with the idea of finding your source of strength, right? So when we abide in Christ, and John 15 says, I am the vine, you are the branches, he that abideth in me. And so when the Bible says that the word of God abides in you, as it says in verse 14, this particular a stage of spiritual maturity means that they recognize that they are unable, as I said before, to really live out their life in Christ by themselves. So they love the Word of God. They don't see it as a newspaper. They don't read the Bible and, 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 and see the, the commands of Scripture as the same level as a, a fortune cookie uh, little thing. 
No. They don't see it as give or take. Well, that's a good thought. I might do that. They see the commands of God as commands. They see the calls of God as calls, and they are a soldier, they are a servant, they have no other choice but to obey. So the word of God abides in them. It says they've also overcome the wicked one. Again, not because they've done this by themselves, but they've done this through Christ. This is who they are. That's why I've said this. They live in the reality of their identity. In Christ, they're strong. In Christ, they love the word of God and abide in it. In Christ, they've overcome the wicked one. And so this is what these young men and women are able to do. You remember when we had a special night or a special service where I had Dave, Melody, Christine, and Kevin up on the stage? Remember we were going through, we were talking about how it would teach sound doctrine. Let's all go to Titus chapter 2. I was trying to think of a way to cross-reference the idea of the young men. Now here I believe it's literally talking about young men. Now, I think it can be applied by talking about the spiritual side of it, just like John is doing here. But um, the aged men, the aged women, the young men, the young women, okay, and Dave and Melody were good sports. No, no offense taken by the, the word aged. We don't mean decrepit. We just mean older. All right. That's weird. Part of the, it's off the screen here. Interesting. All right, so we said the aged men are leaders, okay? Titus chapter 2, we said the aged women are teachers. And who are they teaching? Well, primarily they're teaching children and younger women, all right? So we get to Titus chapter 2, and he talks specifically about the aged women doing that, the aged men. And then um, we see in verse 6, what does it say? Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound, pe sound speech that cannot be condemned, and uh, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed and having uh, no evil thing to say of you. Okay? So he specifically writes to these young men. You might say, well, what's the connection there? We said that the young women are lovers, love their husband, love their children, love God first. And we said to the young men, they're to be warriors. In what way? Well, we said that they were to fight against worldliness, fight against or fight for righteousness, and fight for truth. They're ready to do that. So this stage, spiritually speaking, this is what they're prepared to do. These are the qualities of, what we say, the young men. All right? So I find that interesting. Now, again, as I say, the stages of maturity in 1 John chapter 2, I think in, in, in Titus 2.6, I think he's specifically talking about younger men, by their age, but I think also spiritually speaking. Here's the thing that makes a young person wise, is that they come to recognize that apart from God, they have no strength, but apart from the wisdom of people that have gone before them who are spiritually mature, more spiritually mature than them, they will not succeed. And so sometimes we might even use a sports analogy and say, be coachable, let people minister to you. Sometimes we don't necessarily like that. We think we have it all figured out. And you know what's interesting is as we have people that have come alongside us and have said, oh, I remember what it was like to have three teenagers in the house. It's different. I used to be a youth director. Remember those days? And I used to counsel with people and talk to them about their teenager. I didn't have a teenager. I didn't know what I was talking about at the time. I did from the scriptures, but I didn't know what I was talking about personally. And now we have teenagers in the home. It's different. And I'm not saying that to embarrass Dan Josh or Luke, but teenage boys. It's, uh, there's, there's been some interesting conversations that we've had and how we've had to deal with some things, but God has given us grace. But one of the things I encourage my boys to do is not to act like they know and have all the answers, to listen to their mother, to listen to me, to listen to their grandparents, to give heed to that. And that's really what the young men, I think that's what John is saying. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. We'll close with this thought. That he's saying that they've overcome the wicked one. The word of God abides with them. They're growing. They're maturing. They're heading in the right direction. And I think it's fair to say that there's this understanding that they have a desire to stand strong. And it's interesting what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. He uses a military way of saying, watch ye, be alert, stand fast in the faith. And he says, quit you like men, be strong, be prepared, be ready. Like young men on guard. That's that same word. That's translated young men right here. Quit you like men. That, that the idea of they're a soldier, that they're ready to battle. So he's saying that to this particular stage of maturity. Continue to be on guard. 
Isn't it interesting when we think about different types of temptations that happen even to us as older adults? I guess I'm going to lump myself into that category now, all right? The Bible says, flee also youthful lusts. Youthful lusts. So if you read that as an adult in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, you read that and say, you remember those temptations when you were a teenager in your 20s? That's what that means. Because the mindset is we have to be on guard. So what do you say to a person who's constantly on t- uh, att- attacked in that way, in that age, where some of those things they've not experienced yet? We say there is a purity that must be guarded. A lot of young people who grew up in Christian homes, and, 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 and I praise the Lord for the Christian environment that I grew up in, shelter. You get out there and you hear what the world is really talking about, and you're shocked by that because that's the common conversations. And if you're not insulated through the power of the Holy Spirit and abiding in the Word of God, you just kind of go right along with what everybody's talking about. And you get sucked right into that. And he's saying, watch ye, stand fast, stand firm in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. These challenges are given by the Apostle Paul because we are in a spiritual battle. So he's saying to the young men, be on guard. To those young people, continue to realize who you are in Christ. Continue to be strong in your faith. Those are the two stages that I wanted to talk about tonight uh, concerning those areas. Um, And so we recognize uh, maybe you're here tonight and you're you're, you're still kind of a a little child. You're loved of God. Continue to grow. I met with somebody not too long ago, and I was encouraging them to think about where they're going to be five years, ten years. They go, I just think about tomorrow. That's about it. And I said, think about where you're at right now in your walk with God and think about where you could be as you continue to submit to the Lord. Um, maybe you're here as a young man and, and or a young woman in Christ and God is still maturing you and he's still helping you and he gives you great zeal and passion. Continue to submit to the Lord. And you'll see, you know, I was thinking about this. When, when Andrew and I were, um, we transitioned from uh, not working with the teens anymore and I became the assistant associate pastor and I wanted to start a class uh, primarily focused on reaching our young couples. I remember talking uh, to my mom and dad about this, and this would have been in 2006. So we're talking about 12 years ago. We started the class that we call Family Foundations. My mom and dad said one of the critical parts of their spiritual walk was a class that was done by Bob and Joyce Howell called something similar, the Young Marrieds class or whatever. And, and I think about how many of the people in that class, just about all of them, are now faithfully serving the Lord, and some are still here at Tabernacle. But that was vital. So we think about this. Come alongside people, regardless. Don't come up to them and say, well, I know you're still an infant in Christ, but let me help you out. I don't have to say that. You just, if you have that spiritual maturity, help people and grow. I don't-